Everyone's in? Hello, everyone, um, and thanks again to Tune for having us here today for an awesome, what's been already an awesome day. Um, we're going to kick off this panel just by quickly introducing ourselves. So I'll go first. Um, I'm Alex. I work at the IAB over in London. For those of you that don't know the IAB, we're the trade body for digital advertising. I've worked in digital and mobile for about 10 years. Previously, IAB was at Orange uh, Initiative, so I've had some agency experience myself. Um, Peter told us to sell ourselves when we were doing this, but I'm British. <laughs> that, that is as much as I can take. So, Craig, help me out uh, and introduce well, yourself. We all work for agencies, so we have no problem selling ourselves. Yeah, right. uh, Craig Weinberg, 3Q Digital, Vice President of Mobile. Uh, at our core, we're one of the largest search agencies in the country, and I came on about a year and a half ago to build our mobile practice in the U.S. And I'm uh, Stephanie, I'm the general manager of SOMO's Connected Customer Marketing Division based in London as well. And I see that you guys have uh, this IB yeah. color thing uh, going on here, so that's really, really great. And uh, at uh, SOMO, we make sure that we create success uh, for clients in this uh, ever-changing connected world. We have the privilege of working with fantastic brands such as Audi, ShopDirect, uh, LVMH, and also the New York Times. I'm Ben Bring. I'm the VP Media Director with Ansible. Uh, we are the mobile arm of IPG. Uh, we are a full-service mobile agency, so I head up the media practice, but we also have creative development, enterprise-level solutions as well. So when we look at the mobile ecosystem, it's really about uh, the mobile consumer and mobile signals in general informing everything that we do. And I'm Eric Munier. I'm the SVP of MNC Sachi Mobile uh, here in the U.S. We are a full-service mobile marketing agency or, uh, with a, a global mo mobile-first approach. Uh, we are uh, a performance-based uh, agency and really look at finding effic efficiency for our clients. Um, we have eight offices globally, uh, three of them uh, in the US, uh, New York, LA, and San Francisco. Thank you. Um, great job selling yourselves, guys. <laughs> so we're here to talk about the future of digital agencies, um, and I hear there's some you know, quite well-known futurists appearing in the next few minutes. So um, let's try and take them on. Let's see, <laughs> what do you guys think um, is the future in five years of, of marketing? What are you most excited to, to see coming up for your clients and I guess for you guys' as agencies? Craig, you wanna start? Oh, I'm first? No, why not? <laughs> five years? Yeah, five years. Well, Ray's gonna have the bots like doing all of our homework for us in five mm -hmm. years. Um, I think we'll go like almost fully programmatic at that point. Uh, I think maybe we'll have figured out some fraud detection and we'll have increased transparency just sort of on the media side. But uh, I don't know, things could get really complicated. Yeah. It's gonna be really like messy. We're already overloaded with information. We have too much going on and can't absorb everything that so we have. You're going for more complexity. More complexity, right? Because right. as humans, we have to make it more complex. Right. Yeah. Anyone else excited for stuff in the future? I think five years is really, really hard to predict. Uh, I think Craig kind of hesitated a little bit because it's it's kind of mind-boggling to think about it, right? You know, we're starting to talk about chatbots, which is what I'm really excited about now. But, you know, chatbots are almost becoming passe to a point. I don't think anybody's really doing them well. So that's that's in the moment now. But we're talking about things like, uh, you know, algorithms that are actually developing their own code, right? Mm -hmm. So so programs making programs. What does that really mean for the space? Does it get us to a programmatic spot like Craig is, is envisioning, right? And, and, and truly programmatic. So that's where my head's at. Okay. I was watching a few of those uh, innovation talks uh, from the Cannes Lions, and uh, I, I was uh, hearing that if we don't own an algorithm ourselves, and then probably we'll be working for one of them. Right. But uh, <laughs> leaving, leaving that aside, I think one of the things that we really have to be prepared for is the speed of change, because I think it's happening faster and faster, and also fragmentation. So we heard that we're going to have close to 6.5 uh, billion phones by uh, 2020, and what was it, like 24 billion? billion connected devices by 2020 as well. So that means we have to be ready for it, we have to be agile and be able to, to react as quickly as possible uh, in, the, in the right fashion, really. I think that is, uh, is, a really, is really key to success. It's so, it's so hard to predict, right? I mean, going back five years, I would never have predicted the rate at which digital and particularly mobile has grown, right? From, from the perspective of both in the UK and the US and a lot of other countries, that so much so that we see digital being um, the primary medium for many marketers, and for some, mobile first marketers, mobile is the primary medium. For you guys as agencies, what position does that put you in as largely mobile and or digital agencies? Do you see 
a role in the future for, for these specialist agencies anymore, or are you going to be swallowed up into the, into the kind of traditional agency as, as digital becomes so big? You're not expecting us to say that there's no role for the digital <laughs> agencies, are you? I think what is quite interesting is to, to see in, when it comes to digital agencies that things have changed completely. We have uh, specialists in, in many areas, and what is really interesting, if you look at the top uh, 100 list globally, you will see that uh, companies or system integrators such as IBM and Accenture and Deloitte have sneaked up uh, to the top 10 overnight, and they sneaked in through the back door, and all of a sudden they hold the top two spots and, and number seven for, for Deloitte. So I think that's absolutely incredible, marrying products with, with marketing, so I think we're going to see far more in, in that area, really. More competition for you, for you guys, really. Yeah, we always have. Uh, we like competition. It keeps mm. us on our toes, and it makes us better at what we do. What about for you, Craig? Because I guess you're, compared to these three, a bit less of a mobile-only agency, right? You encompass digital. Do you think that puts you in a, in a better position? Than your, yes. your panelists. Yes. <laughs> That's a surprise. <laughs> no, How we're so? we're all friends. I, I think that uh, in terms of us, I mean, obviously, as one of the larger performance shops in the country, uh, search being our core, um, we sort of look at it. Whenever we start talking to clients, we can talk about search, we can talk about social, we can talk about display and mobile, and the things that we're core and what we're good at, um, and we begin the conversation really anywhere. And we find that once we can perform for the client and build the trust in the relationship, we can start working on other areas. Um, I will never go back to working on a holding company, uh, ever, you can mark my words there. Um, and I think that until each of us on the stage feels confident that like people can install SDKs and can run performance better than us and can have a sixth sense of mobile that they've developed over 10 or 15 years of doing this, there's always going to be a need for us. Mm -hmm. I have a financial advisor to help me manage retirement funds, I still need someone to help me manage my marketing, excuse me, my marketing investment. So we just find more and more that as things change and as come, we have to stay ahead of it. And it's just impossible. If you're doing it internally and you're doing it well, you probably don't need an agency anyway. So, you know, but that's, that's the exception, not the rule, right. I think. Yeah. Eric. I think, um, I think that's a very uh, broad topic on, um, you know, do we need a mobile agency or specialized mobile agency? I see. I think we, uh, the way we see it, we see mobile as a platform, as a bridge between uh, the different channels, mobile as a channel being one of them, digital another one, search and, and so on. Um, so the way we approach that is really to, um, to help brands understanding what the mobile ecosystem or what the mobile as a platform is, uh, as a bridge between those different channels and the strategy and the mobile first strategy should start here, should start to understand the user journey and build um, those, um, those product services and user uh, acquisition journey uh, with that mobile lens when it makes sense. It's not valid for all clients, but it's valid for a lot of them. Um, and then we can execute uh, within those channels in the most efficient way possible. And sometimes it goes with spending most of the budget on mobile because that's the most efficient channel. Sometimes it's digital, sometimes it's pro programmatic, sometimes it's search. Uh, or a combination of, of, of all of this. But uh, I think if we treat the platform as, a, as a really a bridge between those channels, as well as a bridge between uh, the, the untracked channels like TV and billboard and print, um, you know, the, the connector of all of this is the mobile device. And the one-on-one -on -one connection that we have uh, with that device, um, you know, each one of us and, and the penetration growing, makes it a very important piece of the puzzle uh, over the next you know, five years or more. So you guys think that there's still going to be a role for mobile agencies? <laughs> Absolutely. It's shocking. <laughs> um, I, don't know, I don't know if it's some, the, the, the mobile agency per se, but you need to have mobile expertise. You, know? you need to have so systems you need to have You yeah. need to have yeah. people that know and understand that very fragmented marketplace. Uh, and it's different to deal when you deal with mobile. Uh, the reason why mobile is so specific is it's so fragmented and everyone in this room probably know that. You know, we're not kind of we're not inventing anything, but um, I think some brands and some uh, agencies, more traditional digital agencies, don't understand that um, the execution uh, of it is, is more important or is as important as the strategy that is behind it. And sometimes they've got uh, those head of mobile, uh, or those large agencies that are very competent people, that have a ton of mobile experience and they, and they know what to do, but they don't have the execution behind it. They don't have the team that will execute it 
in a mobile first approach or in a mobile approach and then the execution just doesn't align with the initial strategy or the in initial conversations that they had and that's where there is a big disconnect you know with campaigns that are not even measured or uh, or optimized properly as well i mean thank you for whoever uploaded that <laughs> <laughs> You've got some. You've got one supporter. I've got some. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it comes down to. I mean, both of you have kind of touched on it. I'm sure you guys have things to say on it too. The the, the level of education and capability within the client. Um, uh, there's kind of a couple things I guess we could talk about here. Number one, general kind of client understanding, and also the the amount of clients that are taking stuff in house and doing it themselves. Are you seeing a kind of link between those things that the most educated clients are bringing it in-house and executing stuff and kind of circumventing you guys? Uh, and if not, what, what are the, you know, the less educated ones doing? So uh, if you can do product and you can do growth and user acquisition and develop your own audience and you can do both effectively, then you don't need us, in my opinion. You don't. Um, if you are not machine zone, if you're not Supercell, where you have the affordance of a 50-person team or something mm -hmm. that's really, really good at that, because that's what they do every day, then I think you do need us. And the clients that we find that want to do it by themselves, go ahead, do it by yourself if that's what you believe is best for you. We'll be here when you need our help later. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when you fail, come back to us and find us? Is that kind of, you say that to them? No, I don't say that to them. <laughs> you think it. It's kind of bad. It's, it's, it's um, <clears throat> I firmly believe that if you're a product-focused company, you can't necessarily do both unless you are wealthy enough and you have the resources and the investment and the executive buy-in to do both. Right. Uh, and so I think that it's okay to use us at what we're really, really good at mm -hmm. so that your product can shine. Uh, and that you're not weighed down with IOs and tracking installs and fraud and all this other stuff. Yeah. I think um, secondarily to that, for some of the clients that we work with, which are massive, whether it's Exxon or Coke or so on, they know that mobile is important and, and they're actively investing in it, but they can't keep up at the speed that they need to. And that's, that's the other layer of value that you know, a group like us really adds, right? So they're not gonna go and staff, to Craig's point, 50 people, because it takes us two years to staff 50 people who really understand mobile. So I think you know, that's, that's where we, we really layer in. And so far as general knowledge, I think again, it's from a macro standpoint, everybody knows they need to be there. They look at their web trends numbers, it's all moving over to mobile, um, but they're not necessarily thinking about it strategically in some cases. And then even more importantly, they, they simply can't activate, right? So it's almost like the example that Eric mentions around somebody who's very competent, gets it, but really can't take it all the way through. And, and that's where we exist to, to kind of get it to. Yeah, and I think there are also different models. I think we've worked with a, a number of clients who are actually in this room uh, today. And it is interesting. It, it also depends on the phase of, of development. So it might be that a client needs help to, to kickstart uh, their marketing, and then they might uh, start taking certain key partners in-house. I think uh, Facebook and Google tend to be kind of the... Uh, the key uh, partners, clients tend to like to have that uh, direct relationship with, but then they might want to launch, let's say, even a gaming uh, client base, let's say, in, in Finland, because we, we heard from, um, from some of the gaming guys earlier today, and they want uh, local market expertise in Japan, so they might uh, reach out to a specialist in that uh, market. But what we've also seen is hybrid models where for, uh, for launches and things like that, clients will then work with, a, with an agency to help them, even just the, let's say, the strategic element and the planning rather than the execution. So there are very different models we're seeing in the market at the moment. So there's definitely a need uh, for, for agencies to, to help clients with that. What percentage of your, uh, do you think of clients are doing stuff in-house in any form? I know, as you say, there's different models. If you had to guess. A lot of our clients do certain things in-house, mm -hmm. um, and that's fine, mm -hmm. as long as it's like we're transparent about it and we have access to the data. I don't know if I'd be able to put a percentage on it. Um, I don't know, 30, 40 mm -hmm. percent. But so it, as long as we're chunk. open about it, yeah, as long as we're open about it. And we have clients where we manage a channel, um, and we're given a shot at other channels, and if we perform, great, and if we don't, they take it somewhere else, or they take it in-house. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes it's just a client who's got a really great background in social, and they just really want to yeah. do social themselves, and that's the thing, and great, cool, right. yeah. So are the same for you guys, kind of a decent chunk of the people you work with will do some stuff in-house? I'd say for, for our client roster, it's probably less than 5%. 
Really? Okay. Um, I think it's, it's certainly when you're talking about mobile first, it's, it's probably almost closer to 0%. Um, the, some of the things that I do see them take in-house is, is programmatic, right? They'll partner up with the DSP, they'll do some buys. Will that check a little bit of a mobile box for them? Sure. But I think we all understand, you know, when you're doing cross-screen platform buy through DSP, it's not necessarily the most mobile optimized in cases. So it's like, it's more tinkering, at least in my purview. Um, but, you know, that may change, certainly, uh, as people get smarter. But it goes back to the earlier point, right? You can't have one person manage $800 million worth of spend. It's just not going to happen, right? So you have to staff up accordingly. And if, if they're not willing to do that, uh, then it's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. So we talked about data a little bit, um, or we touched on it just now. Um, so let's talk about it a bit more. It's a big, big topic and a big part of what, what you guys do. Um, who, in the relationships that you have with your client, who, who owns the client data? And I guess I'm talking about like programmatic and our data specifically. Um, do clients understand the value of their own data? Are they you know, aware of who owns it and kind of the value of it? Um, or is that something that you're educating them on, Eric? Do you have? I think we're, we live in a world where there's a lot of data available mm -hmm. right now. And for me, there's no question that data belongs to the client. Uh, we're a facilitator of like using that data and understanding that data to make it more efficient. We're coming to, uh, if, I, if I speak for, for our agency, you know, data is at the core of what we do. Uh, that's driving all the decisions from a strategic media creative uh, perspective. This is what is going to make the decision uh, on, on where we optimize and how we optimize. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, but, but data are very, is very complex and, you know, still, in the, in the mobile space, we're catching up with you know the technology that makes that data one visible, available in a consistent and uh, and transparent way for everyone. Um, but we you know the way you uh, use the data and the way you're going to uh, segment that uh, the data and couple that with third party data sometimes will make the whole um, efficiency um, uh, much better for the clients that we work with. So it, it's uh, it's really using the data in the best way possible um, and understanding how you're going to use that to optimize mm -hmm. uh, and be more efficient. Yeah, I think it has to be very clear that the, the data is uh, owned by, by the client. And I think uh, I completely agree with um, Eric on that because sometimes there is, seems to be a bit of a, a blurred line in what happens with that data, be that on, you know, with uh, certain agencies or third party uh, partners. But I think one other element in the equation is the user data that we really have to respect the user's data and giving them uh, the opportunity to, to opt out if they don't want their data shared. So I think obviously in, in Europe that's a big uh, topic and uh, keeping that balance uh, is really, really important, I think. Yeah. I mean, I agree with, with them both. Um, certainly it lives at the client, but there needs to be some sort of cooperation around leveraging it or else what are you really doing? Um, so sometimes easier said than done to, to get that done. And I think you know, we could spend another hour talking about just data, right? Are we just talking about device IDs? Or are we going much, much deeper, right? And sales data and everything else that they, they kind of store and that could help us and inform us to do an even better job. So, you know, again, there's, there's Derek's point again, there's, there's just so much, we, you kind of have to almost point it at what you're specifically looking for and, and for what purpose and, and then kind of drive from there, which is the conversations that I think we have a lot uh, to try and continue to build those partnerships. Yeah, and you, building yeah. context around that, it was actually quite funny when we were talking about uh, data and kind of uh, specific data around mobile right. uh, location and things like that. And obviously, thanks to platforms such as uh, Tune, we can also see if people made it to the next level in the mm -hmm. game. And then we can probably derive from that how they feel. And so we can have, uh, you know, we can then target those happy moments and, mm -hmm. and things like that. So there's some really uh, great, uh, great thing around uh, that as well. So that is kind of incentivized media reskinned and sold this kind of emotional targeting, which I thought was quite uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, I think we're certainly getting there. It's, it's about delivering a level of comfortability with it, right? A lot of this stuff is new, and you know, you say device ID to somebody, and they may not know who it is on the client side, so you have to really start from here in a lot of cases and build and build and build, um, and then go through all of the, the rigor around uh, regulation, uh, litigate, not litigation, but, but legalese, et cetera, all of that stuff, not litigation. Um, but you know, there's just so many different steps that you have to take through it. So I was at a conference last summer in Seattle where this guy Malcolm Gladwell spoke, and he <laughs> talked about the idea of we've got more data than ever, and we think that through data, he was positing that you know, we can make all these informed decisions. And he gave a three or four strong examples of how 
it isn't necessarily, having all this data doesn't help us make better decisions than it normal or informed or experienced human intuition does. And I, I would actually tend to agree with that. And I think from our perspective, there's so much data out there. I, it's not a matter of data this or data that. It's a matter of are we asking the right questions. Mm -hmm. Like the idea of big data informing all these decisions, that's a nice idea. But all the data in the world, if you don't know how to make sense of it, if you don't have the experience and the intuition to back into it, right. wh what what good is all right. of it? You and know? you see that as the role of the agency to educate your clients on how to ask those questions correctly? Or? I think that we are, and I'd love for you guys to agree or disagree with me, I think we are learning new stuff literally every single day that we are able to provide a benefit back to the client immediately. We are learning insights so quickly. Like, just at dinner last night, all the stuff we learned about whatever we were talking about <laughs> is like immediately applicable to mm -hmm. clients. and. Clients love data, that's, that's cool. Like they have their own first party data, which I also think is highly underutilized uh, on their part for obvious reasons. But if we're not asking the right questions with them and teaching them how to look at their own BI and match it against all the stuff that we're bringing to them, and like it's just a bunch of numbers right. at the end of the day. Do you think it's your role to get that first party data, not necessarily out of them, but to get them using it better as well as the kind of other data you have and other stuff you're learning all the time? If it's done correctly and it's, compliant on their end more than it is necessarily on our end talking about PII. I think first party data from the clients is one of the most potent data sets that we could use. Yeah. Do you guys have kind of relationships with your clients where you're kind of right in their first party data yet or is that something you're working towards like creating it? That's a mix for us. Um, some clients are very open and uh, open the door to everything that they do um, so we can work really efficiently um, to anything, um, you know, you know, looking really at the downstream value and, and really what the efficiency is. And some other clients are um, more protective about their data and some of the, uh, um, yeah, some of the data that they want to release to, mm -hmm. to third parties, including agencies. And we need to respect that and we need to work with the data that is available. And I think it's, you know, the first party data and there's also kind of the surrounding of uh, put that data into context and use any third party data or relevant data that can be uh, relevant mm -hmm. for that. And I think, Tune is doing a great job of like, uh, as an independent party, holding that data yeah. on behalf of the client, but not, um, you know, not using that data. Uh, I think if we talk about data, we need to talk about fraud and, and what people can or might do about data. And I think you know, the mobile space is, is still quite new and there's still a lot of like things that uh, a lot of players are working through. Mm -hmm. And some of them might be, um, you know, some of the players might be willing to resell data that it, you know, probably shouldn't. Mm -hmm. So we need to be very careful and fraud detection is also something that is very important and that's why still some clients are very protective about their data and rightly so they should be. Mm -hmm. I think in our world, you know, to Craig's point, we're kind of going through this journey together with them and, and to go back to his other point and Malcolm Gladwell's point is just because you've got so much doesn't necessarily mean it's powerful. Before we can even get to that point, a lot of the time is just cleaning it up, understanding what you even have and then where it's living, because you might have 400 inputs, literally, of, of different data sources, whether it's point of sale, whether it's you know, on your website, your mobile sites, apps, everything else. How do you, how do you actually make it manageable? And I think that's, that's the toughest thing to wrangle, right? So uh, that's, again, a journey that we're learning with our clients uh, on a daily basis, trying to pull out you know, some valuable tidbits. But sometimes you know, more isn't always more. Uh, it, you know, maybe we're, we're overblowing it sometimes. So we have to find out again what the most valuable pieces are and really leverage those. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the notion of paralysis by analysis. Yeah. I yeah. think uh, we come across that quite frequently. And I think the IDFA is a very good uh, example of that. So what is the longevity of the IDFA if that phone goes to someone else or that device goes to someone else? Right. We're still making the assumption that it is the, the same IDFA. So I think we can question uh, some of those signals if they're actually signals or, or just noise. There's a lot of noise out there. <laughs> There's a lot of noise, man. It keeps you guys busy, though, right? It keeps you out of trouble and keeps you in business, right? And that's I think, something that's been talked about a lot, the business of agencies. And, um, you know, there's a lot going on. There's lots of, for you guys to work on and increasing pressure on getting people in to help you, mm -hmm. crunch all this data, service your clients, et cetera, et cetera. How are you guys um, coping with that, with increasing pressure from clients on the bottom line? You know, there's, it, it, is that something you see day to day and have to deal with? I mean, certainly, I think like any business model, uh, you kind of have to manage towards your, your bottom line, of course. Um, in all transparency, I've been on the agency side for a year, so I'm learning a lot on, on many different fronts, but 
you know, uh, it became apparent pretty quickly that, you know, we operate on pretty, pretty slim kind of margins in some cases, uh, and the demands continue to grow, right? And I think that's part and parcel to how fast this space evolves, not just digital, but, you know, of course, mobile specific. Uh, you know, Pokemon, I, I know for the 100th time today, uh, launches or goes big over the weekend, I get 80 emails in my <laughs> inbox to explain why, how, and what can we do to leverage. Um, so, you know, it's just, the ever-expanding role of mobile in, the, in, in our worlds is, is, is kind of layering on the additional asks and demands, which is fantastic, but there has to be a balance between the amount of work you want to do here versus how much you're actually going to support it, and, and that's a constant, you know, back and forth. Mm -hmm. I think that's an interesting question, really, because obviously there's been a lot of uh, press coverage regarding um, agency enumeration uh, recently, and I think that, you know, paying the, the agency on, on time and material basis is probably the fairest model in, in that way because, you know, you're getting a lot of expert advice, but obviously not all clients are, are willing to accept that, uh, that model. And uh, as an agency, we always operate on, you know, our margins are much lower than an ad network, for example, mm -hmm. I would say. My margins are cool. <laughs> Good. How do you do that? Uh, yeah, we should talk. Secret, secret. <laughs> no, I mean, we, we all deal with the same thing. Yeah. Um, I think, so there's a difference between, I think, the clients that Ben is working on day to day and the difference that the three of us are working on and making the switch from the brand world, the big agency world, into the performance world. I think that a lot of these clients, and our clients tend to be a lot of Silicon Valley-based startups, mm -hmm because they take this stuff very seriously themselves, they understand a lot, they value the work that goes into it. And so those conversations, we still deal with the same stuff, but those conversations are a little more open and transparent about hours and time spent. And we're very, very meticulous about when and how we introduce new products and services to clients. And it tends to be either when there's a clear need and we've identified it, and there's a clear need and we've identified the pattern across other clients, or uh, we're proactively bringing it to the client because we feel that we've identified it and there's mm -hmm. something. And we're very open with like, if you don't want to do this, we don't, we, don't, we don't sell stuff. But one of the ways that we've sort of worked around it is, or we're working with it, is um, we're selling our services and turning them more into products. Right. And to the point of being systems facilitators, yeah. we now you know, look at something like setting up attribution. We don't know what that rabbit hole is going to look like when we go down it, if we haven't done a detailed audit on it. So we leave ourselves the option to charge for that as a service and soup to nuts, we will take care of that. And there are a multitude of other ways that we're looking at it, but we start to think about our services more as products uh, and create tiers around them. It clarifies some things, but all these other questions still remain. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, think, I think if you're, I know we're running out of time, but if, if you're transparent with your clients and if you share the burden of the efficiency that you're gonna provide to them, then it's, it's a much clearer um, uh, kind of relationship you know, you, you, you add the value, the success of your clients become you, your success. And that's, that just like put you in the same boat. And we work really closely with partnerships. We're really lucky to work in a very kind of close partnerships with, um, um, with our clients. And that's, uh, we're, we're almost like an extension of their team. And if the cost of providing that service is really clear and transparent and the resources needed to actually provide that, um, there's no issue. We don't have any issues with, um, uh, with any of our clients because we're very transparent on that sense. Right. It's just when you get into that is the hard bit, right? Like, <laughs> If you're honest about it up front from the start, like, it's much easier to have those conversations, yeah. though. Just yeah. no bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy. That's, uh, yeah. That's the, <laughs> that's the dream. We, we are kind of running out of time. Um, I guess just to finish up, um, we've spoken about a couple of things, but what's the one thing that this panel would like the, the audience, the clients in the room to go away thinking about maybe to change their action off of what you've heard in this panel or today, all in, or just in your general life. What, what kind of one thing would you like um, the people in this room to go away thinking about as a result today in this panel? Things are going to break. <laughs> Things are going to break. Things are not going to work. Just be, be patient and yeah. we're working on it. We got it. And uh, understand like it's easy from the outside to say, oh, well, you know, this network isn't working, or why, is, why can't I get this, or why can't I get that? And I've seen teams switch around real quick when they're in the driver's seat working in the positions that we're in. You stop complaining about stuff and why the way things are, and you just have to deal with it, and you go. Right. So 
be open, be social, party around, you know, all this like stuff that we're doing and, you know, just understand that it's way more complicated than any one person or team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to add to that, I think if uh, nothing breaks and you probably haven't tried uh, yeah, hard enough, you haven't, right. <laughs> you haven't pushed uh, the boundaries. I think that's something I learned in, in Silicon Valley that uh, it, something has to break in order to create success. But I think uh, to be really agile and be ready for, for that speed because I think it's going to get uh, more challenging for us moving forward. Yeah. I think for me it's uh, don't take your analytical outputs at face value. Um, if things look too good to be true, they probably are, especially if you're layering on desktop ad tech to your mobile practices. Um, you're not getting the full picture. I would say that mobile is working. You know, it's, it, and, and mobile first approach is working. You know, it, and if, if you are... Uh, if you hear that oh, it, it, it doesn't work, we can't track, we can't, um, we can't measure, mobile is like that, just come to us, we'll make it work because <laughs> it, it does work. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of success and a lot of like positive and efficiency. Um, so if, if this is not working and if you can't measure it and if it's not clear cut, this is because someone is doing it wrong. So we'd be happy to help. Mobile first ad tech. <laughs> Some, some great positive tips, I think, and a really positive note to end on as well. It's important there's lots of stuff going on, there's lots to keep up with, but the opportunities make it all worthwhile. We'll all work together to get, to get through it. So thank you to our panel, thank you again to Tune and to all of you guys. Thank you. Thank you.